Just a reminder this morning as well that uh, today is the third Sunday of the month, and so we'll have the extended homily and then a discussion to follow. So pick up your ears and listen carefully. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel of Q. Jesus said, A man once gave a great banquet and invited many guests. As the dinner hour approached, he sent a servant to tell them, Come, everything is ready now. One by one, they started making excuses. The first guest told the servant, I'm sorry, but I just bought a piece of land and I gotta go to see it. Another said, you'll have to excuse me, I'm on my way to look at five pair of oxen that I've just purchased. A third guest explained, I just got married and I can't come. The servant returned to tell the host about all these excuses. In a fit of anger, the man shouted, Get out right now into the streets and alleys and invite the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Soon the servant reported back, I've carried out your orders, but there's still room. Then go further into the roads and country lanes, the man responded, and lead people back until my house is filled. But not one of those original guests will share the feast. The gospel inspired by God. Do you know the adage, is it used here in America? Patience is a virtue. Can you finish it for me? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Therein lies the rub. <laughs> so the first time I heard this as a small child, the version I heard initially was, patience is a virtue, have it if you can, sometimes in a woman, seldom in a man. But I had a little sister who was only six years old when she became an ardent feminist. So her twist on it was, patience is a virtue, have it if you can, always in a woman, never in a man. <laughs> and being the ardent masculinist that I was at age six or seven, I would respond with the opposite, you know? Patience is a virtue, have it if you can, never in a woman, always in a man. So it's amazing to me the way we can take adages or proverbs or events and twist them to our own purposes. Probably the two greatest truth twisters that we come across regularly would be maybe spin doctors and statisticians. You can do anything, you know, with the data if you're one of these categories. Unless, of course, you're a historian. And the historians maybe are the best of all. You know, they're playing around with the data, reinventing or rewriting history. And that's what I'm going to focus on this morning. In lieu of the gospel reading I just read from, from the Gospel of Cure, I'm going to make four points this morning. I'm, talk, I'm going to talk firstly about the discovery of Cure, then secondly about rewriting history. Then I'm going to take this story and I'm going to unpack it a little bit, the different versions of this gospel story this morning. And then I'm going to focus on an insight from Thomas's gospel about this very story. So the first one, the discovery of Cure. I think possibly the two greatest pieces of detective work I've ever encountered would be the discovery of Pluto and the discovery of Q. The story about uh, Pluto was only discovered in 1920, but it had been inferred nearly a hundred years before because very astute astronomers, as they watched our solar system and the planets that had been identified up to then, they noticed there, was, there were some kind of perturbations in the orbits of the other planets and they were trying to explain how could this be. And one genius came up and he said, well, these perturbations could be explained if there were another planet that we haven't discovered in a particular position, in a particular orbit, with a particular mass. Then the mathematical equations would fit precisely into place. We could exactly know why the other planets are behaving exactly as they are. And he put this theory out and he was kind of laughed out of court. And then in 1920, they discovered it. It's in the exact position, in the exact orbit, with the exact mass that he predicted. So this was, for me, an extraordinary piece of detective work. It's the ability to infer from the data something which can't actually be observed. Now, the very same thing happened with the Gospel of Q that we just read here this morning. 
So when you read through the canonical Gospels, uh, scripture scholars have kind of four troves of uh, stuff available to them when they're doing their work. The first is the canonical Gospels, you know, the canonical scriptures, like the Hebrew scriptures or the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then there's a second group called the deuterocanonical books. So there are seven books, for instance, that you find in the Catholic version of the scripture that you don't find in the Protestant version of the scripture. They're called deuterocanonical because Judaism wasn't sure whether or not to include these seven books in, in, their, in their scriptures. So there'd be the first and second book of Maccabees, Baruch, Tobit, these, these ones, uh, Ruth. So you get seven books which uh, are not included in the canon of the Hebrew scripture or the uh, Protestant scripture, but are included in the Catholic version. So in the Catholic version, we got um, 73 books, whereas in the Protestant version, there's only 66 books in the, in the scriptures. So that's a second group of, of stuff. Then there's a third group called the apocryphal writings. And these are books which are not regarded as scriptural by any tradition, but are very, very, a lot of wisdom in them. Stuff like the secret book of Enoch, stuff like that. And then there's a fourth group which are undiscovered but inferred. They've never found them, but like Pluto, they can infer they must be there. And such is the Gospel of Q. And the great geniuses who inferred this were German biblical scholars in the 1800s. And the way they came upon it was this. When they looked at the uh, three of the four Gospels, what are called the synoptics, and synoptic is just a Greek word meaning a single eye, because it's, they have a single perspective. Matthew, Mark, and Luke have a very single perspective. John is very different, but these three Gospels are very, very close to each other. And what they discovered was that um, in spite of the order in which we named them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Matthew was not the first of these written. Mark was the first written. It was written about 70 AD. Mark, Matthew came about 10 years later, about 80 AD, Luke about 90 AD, and John about 100 AD. But what the scholars discovered was, when they looked at the um, Gospels of Matthew and Luke, they found whole chunks in it, word for word identical, that had been poached and plagiarized from Mark's Gospel. So you get the same event lifted straight out of the Gospel of Mark and imported into Matthew's Gospel in 80 and Luke's Gospel in 90, and they're word for word perfectly just straight taken on. So they obviously figured out these guys borrowed this from Mark. But then there was a whole bunch of other stories that you find in Matthew's Gospel and you find in Luke's Gospel, which again are almost identical, but they're not found in Mark. And so they have to infer there must be another common source that Ma Matthew and Luke both borrowed from. And they call this cure from the German word, quelle, meaning source. So it's an inferred gospel. Unlike Pluto, it's never been found, but has been inferred. And this is the gospel that we read from, from this morning. And so that's kind of the background. It was an extraordinary piece of detective work. But I want you to see what happens, you know, when the writers get at this material. And so to do that, I want to make my second point, which is the notion of rewriting history. And this happens not just, you know, in a, on a global scheme. It's not just the Toynbees of the world who do this. Every single one of us rewrites history. And certainly societies do it, and the scripture scholars do it as well, or the writers of scripture also do it. So every single one of us constantly rewrites our own history. And the reason is this, it is because our sensorium is so limited, and this little laptop that we carry between our ears is so small that we're constantly trying to understand something which is much, much bigger than we can do it. And so, for instance, if you look at the electromagnetic spectrum, the human eye can only see one seven trillionth of the, the, the visible spectrum. And then we got these tiny little laptops to process that. And then we think that the models we come up with actually correspond with what's out there. In philosophy, this is called the myth of the given. The myth of the given is the belief system that somehow our tiny little sensors with their very narrow ranges are able to grok what's out there, and then process it and create accurate representations in our head. And we know this is, this is pathetic, absolutely pathetic. We can't do it. We have no idea what's out there, absolutely no idea. All we can say is, given the senses we have, and given the very narrow range of the senses we have, and given this tiny little computing power that we carry between our ears, here is what we come up with when we try to relate to whatever is out there. But we have no idea what's out there whatsoever. 
to complicate things. As soon as you know, data get into our head through our sensorium, it's influenced by stuff that's in there already. Our fears, our expectations, whatever. Just go to a ball game and watch a dispute about whether was that a try or it wasn't a try. We're all seeing the same thing, but we're processing it very, very differently. So there's been an interesting collaboration over the last 20 years between cognitive uh, psychology, computer science, and neurophysiology. And what they discovered is that so the occipital lobe at the back of the head is the place that we record visual images in. So when it goes through the eyes, through the optic nerve, it's projected onto the occipital lobe. But what they've discovered is 50% of the stuff that gets projected onto the occipital lobe is not happening from the outside. It's not out there. It's been generated intra cranially, you know, by previous experience, by our expectations, etc. So most of what's happening in here is projected back there. To complicate things, every time you retrieve a memory, you massage it a little bit. Because there's two parts to memory. There's the hippocampus and there's the amygdala. The hippocampus is the stuff that deals with just the facts, ma'am, just give me the facts. And the amygdala is the part that has the emotions associated with the event. So, for instance, if I were driving down Channing and I had an accident right outside the church here, yeah, and I come back in three months' time, and let's say, for instance, that there was damage to my hippocampus, and so I can't recall the details, but as soon as I come to the intersection, I start to freak out because the amygdala remembers, but the hippocampus didn't. I have no details, I can't remember anything happening here, but emotionally, I'm freaking out. I have no idea why, but I'm freaking out. On the other hand, if the amygdala were damaged, but the hippocampus were fine, as I drive up to this intersection, I would have full recall of all the details of the accident, but there'd be no energy around it. There'd be no, you know, okay, I just had, this is where I had the accident. That would be it. And so the hippocampus and the amygdala are constantly playing off each other, and every time you retrieve a memory and tell it to somebody, you're actually reworking it. And so it changes, slowly by slowly, it's changed over the years. And so we're all reworking our history. You take two siblings in the same family and you ask them about an event in their childhood and you get two different versions of it. I had a, a client, a mother and daughter, last week and the daughter, you know, accused the mother of one time throwing a tin of peas at her. And the way she explained it, the kid was in her teenage and she was being really sassy and using four-letter words and the mother was cooking the dinner and she got so frustrated she literally took up a can of, can of peas and threw it. Now, the mother remembers it, that she didn't throw the can of peas at the daughter, she threw it at the husband. <laughs> so I have no idea what the truth is. One incident, two totally different explanations. So every time we retrieve a memory, we rework it. So that's true at an individual level. So we're constantly reworking our personal histories. We're certainly doing it as a social group. And we're constantly, you know, the, 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 the leaders very, very often are reworking world history for us. And so we're either totally fabricating events, like false flag operations, in order to justify some kind of a military intervention in a situation, or we're taking existing events that you know, really happened, but we're reinterpreting them in order to justify something. So we're doing this as communities, we're doing it as nations, we're doing it as a species, a global population. And then we're doing it in our scriptures as well. And so when you read through the scriptures, you have to realize that each of these writers has an agenda. He's writing for a specific audience at a specific time in human history. And therefore, even as you look at the four gospel writers themselves, they have very, very different agendas because they're writing at different periods for different audiences with different agendas in mind. And that's the point you want to get to know, why you want to unpack this story for you. So the version we heard was from the Gospel of Q. There are three other versions of this story, very interestingly. There is a, a, a version in Matthew, there's a version in Luke, and there's a version in the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas. And I'm going to leave that one to the end, because for me it's the most interesting. And it leads on to the fourth point I'm going to make this morning. But you heard the story, and the story is that there was a, a man, a rich man, and he decided to have a party. And he invited a whole bunch of people, and they all replied and said, yeah, or his fee, and they all or his fee, and said, yeah, I'll be there. And he spent a lot of preparation, you know, getting this livestock ready and bringing the cooks in. And uh, the day arrived, and he sent out his message. He said, it's ready. Today is the day. You know, five o'clock. See you then. And the first guy said, gee, I'm, I'm really sorry. I didn't think about it at the time. You know what? I just bought a farm, and i got to go see it. I'm sorry I can't make it. And the second guy said, you know, I'm really, really, really sorry, but, you know, I just bought five yoke of oxen. be the equivalent, like, of a tractor. I just bought a tractor. You know, and I got to try it out, you know, get to figure the gears, I need to figure out how to work the gears. I can't make it. And the third guy says, well, 
You know, I just got married a few weeks ago. I'm not going to take time off. I've got somebody else's kind of party. I can't make it. So he comes back, and the man gets really, really upset. The servant comes back and tells him what happened. He gets really, really angry. And he says, go out and bring in the crippled and the poor and the lame and the blind and fill up. I want to make sure that I have a decent party. So the servants go out, and they gather people in. And the servants come back and say, there's still space. And the guy says, I want my house filled. I want to be regarded as a great, great hostess. We've got to have everybody, we've got to have this place packed. You know, my reputation's on the line here. And so go out and you know, bring in anybody else that'll agree to come in. And so finally they, they fill it up. And the last statement then is, but none of the original guests are going to be invited. So that was the version that we heard in Q. You come to Luke's gospel, and Luke is pretty much right on. Luke reports it almost exactly as he finds it in Q. You get to Matthew's Gospel, Matthew chapter 22, and the story is almost unrecognizable. Here's the story in, in Matthew's version. It isn't a man, it is a king. And it's not just a kind of a feast, it's the wedding feast for his son. And he sends out the invitations away at a time, and on the day he's ready, and he sends out his servants to tell people everything is ready, come in. And they don't make excuses in Matthew's version, they refuse to come. Very, very different. They're not just making excuses, they're refusing to come. And the servant comes back and says, nobody wants to come. And the king is totally enraged. He says, all of the servants, he says, tell them it's ready, come in already. And they go back the second time, and this time they kill the servants in Matthew's version. And now the king is really, really infuriated, and he sends his army in, and he kills all of them, and he burns their city. And then he sends out and he says, no, we still go, we got everything ready. I go, I'm going to have a feast, come hell or high water, my son is going to have a decent wedding. Go out there and bring people in. And they drag him in from the four quarters, and they're still not filled, so they send out and he drags people. Even though they don't want to come, they're dragged in, they have to be there. <laughs> so the king can feel good you know, about being a host, a host. And then the king comes in to kind of look at his guests, and there's one guy in there, Bill Burke, and Bill doesn't have a wedding garment on him. And the king goes down and he says, Bill, what's the deal? This is a wedding. How come you have dressed for a wedding? And the guy, Bill said, I wasn't expecting to be here. <laughs> no excuse. Bind his hands and his feet and throw him out into the darkness. He's no longer welcome. Now, do you recognize the story at this stage? It's gone from Q to Matthew. It's a totally different story. So what's the deal there? Matthew was writing at a very different time. So Q, whenever Q was written, there was a very different agenda. Luke is a Gentile. Luke is writing for a Gentile audience. Luke has no beef with the Jewish religion whatsoever. He's writing for a Gentile audience. So Luke is just going to report it as an ordinary man having a feast and the people made excuses. Matthew is writing for a Jewish audience in 80 AD after the temple had been destroyed. And at this stage, normative Judaism and Christianity are splitting apart. Uh, the, the Christian Jews believed that Jesus was the Messiah for which they'd been waiting for 742 years, and normative Judaism did not believe that to be the case. And so they're thrown out of the synagogues, which then means they're regarded by the Romans as, as superstition. The technical, name, the technical meaning of superstition is not about, you know, uh, not walking under a ladder or uh, breaking a glass and throwing salt over your right ear or whatever. The technical definition of a superstition is that a superstition is a cult which has no historical roots. So the Romans, when they occupied territories and they colonized a large part of the known world, when they came into a territory, they were always very respectful of the local gods because they didn't want to anger them. So they were a polytheistic belief system. You had to honor the local divinities because if you moved into an area and you upset the local divinities, it's not very good for the invaders. So they insisted that local populations con continued to worship the local divinities. And here was this group now who were refusing to worship the local divinities, this Christian group. So this could create all kind of wrath for the gods on the Romans. And so now this is what a superstition is, a group that refuses to worship the, the local divinities. And now not only are they thrown out of the synagogues, they're now being persecuted by, by, by the Romans because they're upsetting the apple cart. And Matthew is writing from this. So Matthew is totally enraged. He's Jewish himself, and he's writing for a Jewish audience, which are Christians, but he's inveighing mightily against normative Judaism, which didn't accept Jesus as the Messiah. And that's the reason for this vitriol that you find in the story. It's not just a man having a feast that people make excuses in order not to attend. This is a king who's having a wedding feast for his son, i.e. Jesus, and these people are refusing to attend, and they're killing 
the prophets. And he's going to go in and burn them. And then he's going to be very exacting in what's required to be part of this Christian community. So it's a totally different hit on this story. Let's bring me to my fourth point. There's a version of this story that you find in the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas. And it's very, very interesting. And in this version, again, it's a man having a feast. But the people he invited are already house guests. They're actually staying in his home. And they've been there for several weeks. But the guy decides at some stage he's going to have a big, big party for all these guys. So these are staying in his home, but they're conducting their business in various areas. But they're using his house as a hostelry or, you know, they're kipping down there, or crashing there, or whatever word you want to use for it. So the day the party arrives, and he says to the guys, okay, remember, we're having the big party tonight, and then they start making excuses. But the interesting reaction is, the reaction of this guy is, okay, they can't come. What are we going to do with the food? We bring it to the food bank, give it to the poor, bring in people who don't have food, bring them in and we'll, we'll feed everybody. So they bring everybody in and they feed them all. But then he ends with a very, very interesting statement. In Thomas's version, he says the following. He says, no merchants and no traders have a place in the kingdom of God. Because these guys were going out trading and doing their business and merchandise and they're forgetting you know, the hospitality that be. So I want to unpack that statement for a few minutes. When Thomas says, no merchants and no traders have a place in the kingdom of God, what does he mean by that? So I'm going to go off on a very interesting uh, sideline to explain that. I came across a video a few days ago. I'm fascinated by history and by the cycles of history and the great statement of George Santayana that those who don't, who don't learn from history are destined to repeat it. And I came across this great video uh, looking at the rise and fall of various empires. And I've been fascinated by this for years and years and years. And so when you look historically, there was the great Sumerian civilization about 6,000 years ago in the Middle East. And then there was, following on that, there was the great um, Egyptian empire. And then there was the great Assyrian empire. And then it was followed by the Babylonian empire, which was followed by the Persian empire, which was followed by the Greek empire, which was followed by the Roman empire, which was followed by the Spanish Empire, which was followed by the English Empire, which was followed by the Russian, and there's latterly now the American Empire. And they all go through the same cycles, the very, very same cycles. But this particular video focused on the Chinese empires. China maybe has the oldest, longest. It lasted from 2000 BC down to 1949, so almost 4,000 years. And in that period of empire, there were 23 dynasties. Some of them lasted only, the, the shortest lasted only 14 years, the longest lasted over 800 years. And this, the, uh, the Chinese scholars recorded all of this in, in extraordinary detail. And they identified four phases through which all empires go. And you see this again and again and again in the 23 dynasties in China, and you see it in all the other empires I just mentioned. And the four stages are, there's the hero, the sage, the merchant, and chaos. And here's what the four stages always look like. So the hero stage is where some individual or some group comes along to help us throw off the shackles of some kind of tyranny which had existed before that. And so the hero comes in and rescues us from the tyranny of a previous individual or regime. And when the hero arrives, obviously everybody rejoices. Peace breaks out. There's protection for the citizens. There's a lot of uh, uh, energy put into the infrastructure, building infrastructure. Crime goes away, way down. Protection for the citizens goes away, way up. Women's equality takes a huge leap at this stage of, of, the, of the cycle. And so everybody is really, really happy with this state of affairs. The next stage is the sage. Now they've established themselves, uh, the infrastructure continues to be built upon, and there's tremendous influence now and, and uh, energy going into, and money going into arts, literature, philosophy, mathematics, science, architecture. So there's a huge, big uh, push towards uh, universities, this kind of thing. Great, uh, uh, great protection for the citizens. Women's rights are at an all-time high at this stage of the evolution. And so everybody is being provided for crime has gone away, way down. Stage three always comes, and it is the merchant phase. And that's why I'm tying it into Thomas's gospel. And the merchant phase is now an oligarchy of greed begins to take over. And there's more and more acquisition into fewer and fewer hands. 
And there's a lot of uh, colonial expansion. Uh, foreign wars are engaged in at an extraordinary rate. And to kind of uh, to finance these foreign wars, there's extraordinary taxation happening on the populace. So uh, injustices now are beginning to become prevalent. The justice system is compromised. Women's rights uh, take a nosedive. The infrastructure begins to go into decay, and the whole thing begins to collapse. And very, very often at this stage, the leader, our leaders, are very effete kind of characters. They're like you know, the, uh, the, the, the crazies of the Roman Empire, who was the, the, the Caligulas, you know, crazy people are effete kinds of individuals who are at the top of the pyramid at this stage. And then the fourth stage is the chaos. At this stage, the citizenry who have been totally oppressed begin to revolt. Or some foreign po power comes in recognizing that the dynasty has collapsed or the empire is over and they come in to take possession of it. So there's total turmoil, there's a total breakdown in, in uh, infrastructure and crime rate goes way up and women's rights go way, way down. Now that's the cycle that you see in the Chinese dynasties. That's the cycle you see in the Sumerians, in the Assyrians, in the Babylonians, in the Persians, in the Greeks, in the Romans, in the uh, Russians and in America laterally. 85 human beings now own more, more property or have more assets than 3.5 billion human beings right now. So this is total aggregation. And so this is what happens, these are the cycles before the next hero, whatever the hero looks like, comes about. And this is precisely what Jesus is addressing, you know, very, very often. He tells this great story one time, he says, in the days of the Son of Man, it will be just like it was in the days of Noah. People were eating and drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage right up to the time the flood came, and it came in and destroyed them all. So it will be as it was in the days of Lot. When Lot let, left Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah, people were eating and drinking and building and trading, and God came down with fire and brimstone and destroyed all of them. So it will be in the days of the Son of Man. So I think that Christ is not just talking sociologically. He is not just talking about this cycle that happens in human cultures. He's also talking about the cycle that happens intrapsychically or spiritually inside in each one of us. So each of us experience something like this kind of a cycling, either in, our, in the course of our lifetime, that there are various stages in which we experience this, or intrapsychically in our spiritual development where we experience it. There's the hero that we encounter at some stage, maybe a great avatar, like a Jesus figure or a Buddha figure or a Mahatma Gandhi or a Mother Teresa, somebody that inspires us and sets us to light in our spirituality. And, you know, we, we embrace it, we meditate regularly or we read spiritually or whatever we do. And then at the next stage of the, the sage, where we want to study more and, more and more and know more and more about this spirituality or this life. But at some stage, you know, we get distracted by paying our mortgage or whatever we're going to do, we get distracted from our spirituality and more and more, you know, our spirituality begins to wane until finally some kind of a crisis comes to wake us up again. And so you can see crisis or chaos as an evil thing or you can see it actually as an invitation to spirit you know, to get back on track and realize that we are not human beings who have occasional spiritual experiences, we're spirit beings having a human experience, that we've come from God we go back to God, and this is a mission we're on. And we came down here in order to try to learn in all circumstances. We did not come down here to be priests or psychologists or farmers or merchants. That's, that, that's parenthetical to our being here. Each of us came down here in order to learn how to love in all circumstances. Whether I'm born into a crippled body, you know, with an IQ of 85, or I'm born into an athletic body with an IQ of 170, whether I'm born into a very rich family whose father is a CEO in Palo Alto, or I'm born into a, a family in North Africa as a slave girl in the 1300s, it doesn't really matter. Can I learn to love in whatever circumstance I find myself in? And that's the journey. That's the cycle of these four pieces. So while it is true sociologically, it is also true, maybe even more importantly, intrapsychically or spiritually. Because the universe is a fractal phenomenon. Fractals are the mathematical notion that um, uh, patterns occur at varying levels, varying degrees, you know, but it's the same pattern. The pattern you find inside in an atom of a nucleus, you know, an electron spinning around it, is the pattern you find in our solar system, is the pattern you find in our galaxy. We find so that we live in a fractal reality. And the fractal of the sociological cycles is also represented more powerfully and more importantly in the fractal and the patterns of our intrapsychic and our spiritual activity. And so in order to be able to counter 
the cycles of this society and the culture, we have to gra grapple first with the cycles of the psyche. We have to look at our own lives and find out, where am I asleep at the wheel? Is there, is, am I entering into the trader merchant phase of my life right now? Or am I breaking through into the hero part of it? Am I alive? Am I in the sage part now? or the chaos part. And even if I find myself in the chaos part, can I use this as a way to bootstrap myself back up into the next cycle of the hero? So what I would love to do for the, the next half hour, you know, we can discuss all of these things if you want. I'd love to hear from people as well of you know, their own life journey and where perhaps in their life that you've encountered these various stages you know, and what you did with them. So I'll open it up there. Bail your wife, it's good to see you. And Trassa, you're very welcome. <laughs> do you want to, do you want to, do Michael, do you want to give Michael? Give us your wisdom, Bill. Give us your wisdom. distress with the official posture of uh, the church that I was raised in created the chaos for me internally <laughs> that leads me to a hero like you or someone else who might have been my hero, someone who, whose book I read that inspires me, moves me, in fact changes me. So I can acknowledge that I am aware of passing through these cycles. I find it pure joy to mm -hmm. hear you articulate these macro concepts into a very personal, individual uh, structure. And I find it exciting to consider that without having thought much about it, I'm experiencing it. That's brilliant. That. brilliant. It, it's just remarkable. Brilliant. And you articulate it so well, I can only feel gratitude and I can feel a sense of comfort. Fabulous. Fabulous. That I am not alone, that I'm okay. part of a, of a mystical Family. process brilliant. that we are all engaged in. And I embrace all of you in our journey. Okay. So Thank you, Bill. Know, That's back. beautiful, Bill. In case you haven't noticed, Bill is a poet by nature. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Bill. Thanks a million. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Somebody who wants to get in next? Jeannie. Well, since nobody else is speaking. Okay, so I love what you said about the interpretation of the different Gospels. Because my sister, she lives in Kansas City. She's a lector and a feminazi. <laughs> wow. And <laughs> when she reads the Gospel about the woman at the well, it's so funny. Because, and then when she talks about it, and she says, uh, she, when she uses the inflections, uh, with the woman of the well, it's a whole different interesting. interpretation. Interesting. Like she says, okay. uh, like the woman answers, she says, oh, so you think you know. Okay. You know <laughs> she, she, when my sister reads this at the altar, you know, at okay. the ambo, yes. she puts these inflections and you get a whole different Spin idea about it. the woman at the well. <laughs> Do you all know the story to which Jean is referring? Yeah. yeah? It's a story in John's Gospel, chapter 4, of Jesus in this, and. Um, um, a Samaritan town and he goes to a, the, the disciples have gone into the village to buy supplies and he's sitting out there well but he has no bucket to get the water of the well and this woman comes out and he says get me some water real kind of harsh she's kind of looking at him first he's Jewish and she's Samaritan and there's tremendous animosity between them she said you're asking me a Jewish man asking a Samaritan woman to get him some water so it's a real kind of a 
<laughs> back and forth. And he says, uh, he's interrogating her. And he said, if you knew who it was who was asking you for water, you'd be asking me for water. And then he says, go back and bring out your husband. And she says, I don't have a husband. And he says, you're bloody right, you don't have a husband. You had four husbands, and the guy you're with now isn't your husband. <laughs> so that's kind of the story as far as Jesus' point of view. But the woman gives as good as she gets from it. And I love uh, Jean's sister then putting an inflection in it where this one is really standing up for herself and you're, who the hell do you think you are? You're my village, buddy. You don't have a bucket. You get your own bloody water. <laughs> yeah. So all of these stories are written because the author has an agenda here. Yeah. So it's very important to realize that. Even by inflection, as Jean points out, already changes the interpretation of the story. Yeah. Brilliant. Great, great example. <laughs> Jean. Um, I actually watched the video that you okay, referred brilliant. to, brilliant. and so I have two questions. Good. One is that at the end of the video they talk about that the way society or civilization yeah. survived was in the monasteries. Yes. And um, I actually thought they might be going a different place than they yes. went with it. It was really just these enclaves of culture that, that survived. But my question is, what about... I mean, I think that we all see that things are changing, evolving, mm. spiraling, whatever mm. we want to call it, in terms of universal consciousness. Mm. And the hope would be, I mean, I think that if, you, if we accept, which I do, that what we're here for is to take whatever spin we got this time and bring it to love. Mm -hmm. um, how does the overlay of the evolving consciousness or the changing consciousness affect that? That's brilliant. That's brilliant, Jean. I totally agree with you. And so the historical narrative would suggest that there has to be a descent into chaos, and sometimes you know, uh, years and years, and sometimes hundreds of years of warfare and turmoil in order for the kind of to, to readjust itself. I don't think it necessarily has to be like that. When I look at nature, sometimes nature can immediately rectify a situation. In fact, when you study uh, astrophysics and you look at the Big Bang, the theory of the Big Bang, Within nanoseconds of the Big Bang, it looked like this experiment of our cosmos was going to fizzle out because the Big Bang was creating particles of matter and antimatter in equal measure. And when matter and antimatter meet, they annihilate each other. And so it looked like within nanoseconds of the Big Bang, the whole thing was just going to fizzle out. Now, a lot of universes fizzle out because according to quantum mechanical theory, there are 10 to the power of 27 brand new universes created every second for every cubic centimeter of 11-dimensional mathematical space. So they're spinning off universes at a phenomenal rate. Uh, but many of these are mathematical duds. So it looked like ours was going to be a mathematical dud. But something switched. There was a slight, you know, correction to the formula within nanoseconds. And for every one billion particles of antimatter, there was one billion and one extra particle of matter created. And from that slight imbalance, the entire universe we see around us, 200 billion galaxies with 150 billion star systems in each galaxy, everything from Shakespeare to tulips were created out of that slight, <laughs> slight adjustment. So the universe itself made an instant correction. So sometimes corrections can be instantaneous and sometimes they take a lot of time. So where are we at in our evolution? I'm totally convinced that there is an awakening happening in our world. And particularly, I'm fascinated at the notion of what is sometimes called uh, the indigo children or the crystal children. There are children born at a specific period of human history who are of a different order to the rest of us that came in. There are much more advanced beings, and they're given two different names. Those who started coming in around the 1980s are called the indigo children. Those who started coming in around the turn of the century are called the crystal children. And they have a very, very different kind of a consciousness. Even at very, very early ages, they're deeply mystical, deeply spiritual, but also evolved a lot in ecological considerations, in economic in injustices, and are actually doing things about it. So I'm totally convinced that, literally, you know, when we pray to our, our angels or angelic beings, those who live at different levels of in intellect and grace, to come in at times of crisis, they come in. And they're sending us, you know, the commandos, these young children coming into our midst at this stage, who've been born among us and have a very, very different mindset. So I think it is very possible that we will make a fairly seamless transition. It doesn't have to be a bloody chaotic version like we've done so often before. And that all it takes is for 10% of the population to shift into a Christ consciousness in order for it to become uh, available through osmosis for everybody else, and the whole thing changes radically and very, very quickly. 
So personally, I have tremendous hope for our world and for particularly through our kids. Yeah. Margaret. Well, I, I just, I think I just have a question. Sure. Um, is, is chaos always a, a negative thing? Yeah. I, I mean, I don't, I think of chaos as, um, as the source of um, everything. Totally. Uh, yeah. uh, so I always think I have a chaotic mm -hmm. God. Okay, good, good. And every time, good. you know, 18 million times a day, mm -hmm. when I get feeling mm -hmm. chaotic, right. I go, well, God, you're speaking to me now. Totally. Ayo. It just, it's a That's because you're a woman. <laughs> it's because I'm fixing the damn dinner. All right. It's chaotic. <laughs> You're absolutely right, Margaret. You're absolutely right. And so um, there's a whole theory of chaos, you know, it's a, a allied to kind of complexity theory with the belief system that uh, by rearranging the parts, you create a much higher order of complexity. There was a guy who won the Nobel Prize in biochemistry in the 1970s, a guy called Ilya Prigogine. He was a, a Russian um, a scientist, and he came up with a, a system called dissipative structures. And it resolved an old, old controversy in science. They couldn't put together how, if the second law of thermodynamics is true, that all systems left to their own natural devices descend into chaos, how come more and more complex life forms are evolving? If, there, if we live in a chaotic world in which everything descends into kind of uh, chaos, how come there are more and more complex life forms emerging? And he created this theory that he called, he did it with crystals in his laboratory showing what he called dissipative structures. That there are some systems that learn how to dissipate the entropy out of the system and reorganize the components into higher parts. So you're dealing with the same components, but you're reconfiguring them differently. And the example I use sometimes is, imagine you're working on a jigsaw puzzle. And I'm sure you've had this experience many times. And so let's say it's a 500 piece jigsaw puzzle. And you're doing really good, you get the four corner pieces, you get the lines in, and now you've got colors and contours to suggest to you which pieces go where. And you work it through, and at some stage, there's 40 pieces on the side, and no matter where you try to fit them in, they won't fit. And you're tearing, oh, the guy, what am I doing here? And no matter where you try, you twist every piece in every direction, you put it into every opening, and it'll fit nowhere. And then you come to the offer realization, oh my God, I can't believe it. This whole section up there that I thought was correct isn't. I put them together because it looked like the contours match, but actually the colors don't fit. I'm not getting the picture on the box. So I have to disassemble this piece and redistribute the pieces elsewhere. And now the 40 pieces start fitting in and I fix the jigsaw puzzle. So it's like we're not adding anything to the equation. We're using all the same pieces, but we're reconfiguring their connections. And that's what, that's what chaos and complexity theory mean. That's what Ilya Prigogin was about, and that's what our lives are about. I keep saying to people, life is like a jigsaw puzzle. Everything that's there is necessary, and everything that's necessary is there. There is nothing missing from your life in order for you to become an enlightened, Christ-conscious being. And there's nothing extraneous in your life. There's no person, there's no event, there's no circumstance which is extraneous to your development. Everything that's happened to you, every experience you've had, has been a necessary piece of the puzzle. And there are no extra pieces, and there are no missing pieces. You have everything you need in order to become whom you're meant to become. And chaos theory is that realization that what appears to be this chaotic, you know, breakdown is actually the reconfiguration of the pieces. And Hinduism actually dedicates an entire person of God to that process. You know, they call it Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. Brahma is the creative force. Vishnu is that which sustains order, and uh, uh, Shiva is that which destroys. But not in the sense that this little boy stomping on his Lego set, but is it reconfiguring the pieces in order to create higher levels of complexity. Karen. I got a weird ear. So I'm interested in the chaos that occurs intrapsychically. And just listening to you talking about the pieces, it seems if you are having those kinds of experiences, you need to make sure that the pieces you're using are actually the pieces without the stories. That they're That's otherwise brilliant. you won't. Brilliant. won't Absolutely. Get there. Uh, did you all hear what Karen said? Um, when you're putting the pieces into position, you need to realize, you need to know that you're putting the pieces in without the stories. 
And what she means by this, I'm presuming, is, you know, it is the stories we tell ourselves that crucify us. I've distinguished many times between pain and suffering. The Buddha said famously one time, pain is inevitable. It's the price of incarnation. It's also the medium of, of enlightenment. Suffering, he said, is optional. Because pain is the price of you know, admission into incarnation and is the medium for enlightenment. But suffering is always the result of inadequate stories that we make up about the pain we're experiencing. So, you know, the suffering is optional. It's not necessary at all. It only comes because we're uh, foisting, you know, bad storylines on the experiences we're having. And so in order to put the pieces into position correctly, you've got to divest them from the stories, the stories that get in the way, the stories that says it has to go in there because the contours are right, even though the picture on the box is not emerging from my efforts. So I have to tell myself a different story. I'll let go of the story and just utilize the experiences themselves. Is that what you were meaning? Yeah, brilliant. Patricia was next. Michael, sorry, Patricia. I think that um, the idea of the cycles is, um, <coughs> is one construct, um, which doesn't always square with my reading of history, Kay. but that's aside. <coughs> but uh, um, an idea that, that I experience in my reading of history and in my reading of my own life experience is that the hero, the sage, the merchant, <coughs> and chaos are all one. Okay, brilliant. And the, the, the yeah. that while I may be experiencing chaos, okay. I'm also in the presence of okay. the art, the music, the literature, all the wisdom of the time. I'm in the experience of being present with heroes, okay. um, many of whom are in this church. Okay. And then I'm also in the presence of those temptations to, in a sense, think that material gain can satisfy my deepest needs. Mm -hmm. So that it seems to me that it's all one happening at the same time. That's brilliant, Patricia. You're absolutely right, totally right. Because in a sense, you know, time is, a, is an artifact of human consciousness. It's because this little laptop is so small that in order to process the gestalt of life, I have to break it up into bite-sized pieces and process it sequentially. But you're absolutely right. It's all there right now. There's only, when you come into the eternal now, you're coming into timelessness in which all the ingredients are always ever-present. You're absolutely right. Brilliant insight. Brilliant insight. Chris. So I was just going to say that there have been two... Um Put, put it up closer, Chris. Sorry, yeah. there have been two uh, very huge events in my life that have each time have turned me back to that um, that God part inside me Great. that all of us have. And the the last um, big event that happened was was so incredible because um, I was in such a deep dark place, and after coming out of it and it was a period that lasted for about three and a half years, I realized that I had been protected Beautiful. all along. Beautiful. Brilliant. And at one point, I was um, <coughs> undergoing a, a Reiki healing with a friend of mine, and she really didn't know a lot about what was going on. And... Um, as I was laying on the table, I was surrounded by angelic beings. And I really, honestly, at that point in my life, I, I had a question about whether angels were sort of an intellectual construct that we create, because we create a lot of things in our head. And in that moment, I knew that they were really Darling. very real. Darling. And, uh, and I kept quiet about the experience and I just lay there and, and drank in that beauty and at, when I got off the table when the session was complete and we sat across from each other she was beaming and she said wow the top of the house came off and there were all these angels <laughs> and it was confirmation that they're really always there for us we just need to ask and that part of that, in the midst of chaos, mm -hmm. to your point, in the midst of chaos was all this beauty. Mm -hmm. 
and all of this love and all of this protection and the sage and the hero were existing at the same time. That's brilliant, Chris. Just to illustrate right. what you were yeah. saying, Patricia. Yeah. You're absolutely right. I mean, the truth is that the air is thick with spirit. There's a reason why in Hebrew the word ruach means breath, life, spirit. In Swahili, the word pepo means breath, life, spirit. In Greek, the word pneuma means breath, life, spirit. And even in English, it sneaks in in English. You know, inspiration literally means to take the spirit in or to breathe in or to be creative. And expiration means to let go of the spirit, to breathe out or to die. And so in many languages, they've captured this. The air is literally thick with spirit. It's only a question of can I, can I tune the dial a little bit? It's not like we have to go someplace in order to encounter them. You know, we have to shift the consciousness state. That's all that is. Yeah. The air is thick with spirit right here, in every place. Mary Kate. The part of the Eucharistic uh, prayer of the cosmos that I really like is okay. you are who are the gentle mother watching while the great crises of our times are understood what they really are. Great opportunities were seen beyond the separation into the oneness of Islam. Yes, absolutely. There's the same notion that so many of you are picking up on now, the chaos piece. Pat uh, Patricia's piece, you know, it's all present, Chris's piece. It's true. It's only a question of seeing differently. It's a question of changing the storyline. It's a question of tuning the, kind of the, to the consciousness device so that we access what's already around us. Yeah. There's no place to go. Yeah. Susie. This reminds me of a story um, this, uh, uh, of the same thing. When I was down in Guatemala on <coughs> my medical mission, we ended up getting caught in Antigua in a um, hurricane. And it, it was an uh, earthquake that caused a volcano, and then oh. the hurricane came through. And we were in this hotel, and I was in a room by myself, and the cable went out, and so there was this picture on the TV. I had the TV on, but, but there was nothing on except for this still. If you went through the channels, it was just like a still picture, and there was one of Jesus and Mary. So I kept that on the, the TV and just meditated on the, the weather improving because we were already were having a difficult time getting out of the country and had to make other plans. So I just for, I don't even know how long, I just sat very quietly and meditated on that still picture of Mary and Jesus, asking, you know, meditating on the weather clearing up. <coughs> Wasn't supposed to for like two more days. And then at uh, 6 a.m. the next morning, I woke up and I could hear the birds chirping. Ah, beautiful. Love. So it just made me think of right. the chaos yes. going on outside right. and the still picture of Mary and Jesus mm. and, and just mm. this meditation that I had. Mm. That's beautiful. So it's beautiful, I mean. Beautiful. I just had a, um, a comment. Sure. So I've been thinking about the different cycles that you were talking about with the hero, the sage, the merchant, and chaos. And earlier in my life, I find that it, it took time, years, to work through the cycles. But now that I'm older, it seems like I wear those hats okay. all the time. Okay. So I'm not necessarily simultaneously, but from one minute to maybe 10 mm -hmm. minutes mm -hmm. to an hour. And mm -hmm. I cycle through these different mm -hmm. hats. Mm -hmm. And I, I try to work with chaos as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. Try to see what the lesson mm -hmm. is as quickly as possible. Yeah. But to really understand that these are different roles that I, I play in this uh, current phase of life that I'm in. That's brilliant, Michael. It's interesting that the Native American Indian tradition, uh, they don't use the word chaos, they use the word confusion, but they say that confusion is the field of all possibility. Confusion is the field of all possibility. And so in other words, if you're in a confused state and you try to reduce it quickly to an outcome, you're impoverishing the possibilities. So they're big, big into just stay with the confusion for a period, just sit in the chaos and let you know, the universe or spirit decide what the appropriate outcome is going to be. But we want to collapse it down really, really quickly to a specific outcome to get out of the chaotic 
the situation. So having the ability to stay in the chaos, as so many of you said again, that's a real, that's a real spiritual meditation, allowing spirit to determine when and where and how you know, the solution suggests itself. Karen. But I think what makes that so difficult is that there's so much cultural bias against staying in chaos that um, people have, a, you know, there's this kind of expected culturally trajectory of, you know, of doing certain things and certain things working out. And, you know, and so you not only have your own kind of fear and discomfort with that state of chaos, but you have everything around you saying, <coughs> it's not helpful. You know, so this is really against, it, it takes a lot to, to let that drop away in order to, to live, uh, or as Pima Chodron would say, you know, to live in the fear, to turn, a, it's like the nightmare, right. turning around to look right. at it. Brilliant. And that's why I, I love the, uh, <coughs> the old um, Taoist symbol of the yin-yang, because so often in our culture we, we kind of celebrate light as being evidence of enlightenment, and we denigrate Literally, the darkness has been evidence of you know, sh shadow material or even demonic in some cases. And for the Taoist insight, the Taoist insight was that the darkness is the mystery out of which everything emerges. It is the, the dark, fecund womb out of which all possibility emerges. And so it, you can fertilize it, but you have to be prepared to be there for a period of time. But when we, when we think the darkness is the bad thing and the, you know, the light is where we move towards. So having the ability to stay in the darkness <coughs> and embrace the mystery of the darkness in order to allow uh, something to be conceived, a life form to be conceived, that's really difficult for us in the West. Johanna. <coughs> um, I think that um, the expectations of uh, the current age that we're in now um, are that things are clear and instantaneous. You know, um, <laughs> you can take care of something in an instant on your iPhone. You can solve problems, you can do this, you can do that, and everything is um, minimal and sped up faster and faster and faster. And, our, and I think that's what Karen in, is addressing also, this um, especially where we live, of this expectations where things are in a certain order, things are in a certain way. And internally, um, it just gets more difficult and difficult to uh, deal with that speed, number one, and to live here and not be within that parameter. Um, you know, you are looked upon differently. It's, it's just like, wait a minute, you're not this or you're not that or whatever. Why, are you, why do you have these problems? Why do you think that you are having a problem? Um, and the other, the other part of that is, um, as an artist, um, I think that there's a part of you that constantly deals with chaos <laughs> to produce something. Yeah. There's a, a massive amount of things to pull from and you're pulling and you're, you're com coming and going with different ideas and things like that. Um, and the other thing is just a quick story. After um, my divorce and my sister passed away, I went down to Los Angeles to visit a friend and she was in the entertainment industry in Los Angeles. And um, I went to a very, c I'd never been to a catered party. This place was plush and amazing and I absolutely didn't fit in. And somebody asked me, so what do you do? And I just looked at them and said, I'm growing my hair. <laughs> 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 I mean, it's just like, if you're just brave enough to just say okay. it, you know. <laughs> I mean, we went later in a silver company to have sushi. I'd never done any of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you, Jenna. Good for you, Ben. Brilliant. I made just one, one response to the second point you made, you know, that they're going to stay, as an artist, staying in the chaos and see what emerges. It fascinates me that, for instance, um, literally all creative exercises are just about reconfiguring existing pieces. So you take, for instance, the entire, all the collective works of Shakespeare. Where do they come from? 26 symbols. We call them the alphabet. Just by rearranging different permutations and combinations, the complete works of Shakespeare emerges. You look at, you know, all the music of Beethoven. Where did that come from? 
just by rearranging, you know, six or seven cards or whatever. You know, that's what it is. What about um, the, our DNA? It's just basically the reorganization, reorganization of four nucleotides. Yeah? So you just take these four, you combine, permute, and all life form on planet Earth emerges. Or my favorite example, binary mathematics, which was invented by a mathematician at the university I attended, a guy called George Boole. He invented Boolean algebra, except he was there 100 years before I arrived in the 1840s. He invented Boolean algebra, our binary mathematics, which is the basis of all computer technology. Everything you, know, you do on a computer is reduced to zeros and ones. So from zeros and ones, you create all the experiences you have on a computer, <clears throat> whether you're looking at a photograph, a video, or hearing music. It's all zeros and ones. So even with just two elements, you can create this multiplicity of possibility. And that's what chaos is about, having the courage to sit in the dark until we reorganize the pieces to create the new complex outcomes. Uh, Alfred was trying to... How are we doing for time, Mike? Three minutes. So we got Alfred and then Patrice. Let's go back to uh, the Big Bang. Okay, amen. <laughs> so Have you time? <laughs> well, it's going to be real fast, okay. real fast trip. <laughs> the Big Bang occurs. Okay. Energy is uniform yes. instantaneously. Yes. And then begins the entropy function and yes. disorder yes. starts to occur. Yes. It occurs to me that evolution mm -hmm. is not possible unless disorder occurs in a uniform universe there could be no evolution it's that's perfect brilliant. that's brilliant so carrying yeah. the idea a little further yeah. i can understand you know god's hand in all this yes yes and now we are where we are and we've discovered oh the universe is expanding mm -hmm. well we knew that mm -hmm. except it's expanding at an ever increasing rate mm -hmm. and in the future i can see all of the atoms and the energy mm -hmm. and the worlds uh, hurtling away from one another until there's just a void. I love it. What am I to make of that? Yes. I know exactly what you... <laughs> I, knowing you as I do, Alpha, I know exactly what you're going to make out of it. You're going back into the uh, darkness out of which the next game will emerge. Mm. Yeah? The next phase of the game. So, so it's not a, yeah. a, uh, an Amen. empty, hopeless... No. Game. Not at all. It's just another version of chaos. Yeah? It's a, it's a way in which one version of the game ends and a new version of the game begins. But it's all God's play. You know, we're, all, we're all God's, you know, we're characters in God's drama, all of us. We've finished with you, Patrice. Um, Sean, this is so interesting this morning, this Brilliant. issue of chaos, because uh, one of the reasons Mike is not here this morning is he had nightmares all night about chaos. Oh, God, but love it's him. because we're trying to dismantle a home of 42 years. Oh, wow. Neither one of us want very much at all and don't wow. need very much. Wow. But the last few months have been very chaotic. Uh -huh. But I find myself waking up in the morning, I can hardly wait to tackle it because it, it just frees you up so much. You totally. realize what you need and what totally. you don't need. And what we need at this point is so simple. That's brilliant. You mentioned at the very end of your sermon, but it's friendships, health, spirituality, joy, children. It, it's so simple. That's it's awesome. It is. to have this time brilliant. and a time to get rid of all this stuff that we don't need. That's so brilliant. Let me make one final comment on that, that I am sure you're aware of it as a psychologist yourself, that the, uh, in, in many psychologies and in many spiritual systems, the house is the uh, metaphor for the psyche. And the idea of dismantling the house, you know, is a beautiful uh, message about, you know, moving into a deeper, deeper understanding of the self. So good for you and good for Mike. Guys, thank you so much for your patience this morning. <laughs>